Best coaches in the game, huh? We really ain't playing. We regroup up in the Slack chat where the coaches debrief. We be piecing these puzzles, occupy the chunk of the pie. Ain't no lie when we hit the block, helmets, casket is got. You be seeing helmet after helmet, helmet after helmet. First place, second place, fifth place, eighth place, twelfth place, fifteen, sixteen, twenty. So many helmets, you got blur vision, we got too many. Dick your check. Oh man. They got us fucked up. Army, regroup. We pledge always to have that edge. We don't fire warning shots. Competition just dropped. We locked and loaded before lock. Whatever the time, yeah. Do we even correlate? Being the best requires a willingness to outwork your competition. There's always someone smarter, faster, sharper. More naturally gifted. Welcome back to FS Army. It's Fantasy Fling for another week of the MME strategy of the Millie Maker and Millie Maker Review. Crazy week. Your boys, several DFS Army subscribers and uh, VIPs, of course, and staff were on the some of the hot plays, as we will see. Justin Fields and whatnot. A lot of the MME pros... What they did this week is they were playing a large pool of quarterback stacks, different quarterback stacks, just eating a lot of that running back chalk, as we'll get into a little later, and as well as wide receivers. So just being flat on the wide receivers, we're going to get into that. But first, let's take a look at the Millie Maker. What took it down? Let's go. I write this every week at dfsarmy.com. It's a free article. If you're a VIP, even better. Uh, but this article is available at dfsarmy.com. So, and what we like to do, and let's share my spreadsheet real quick. Now, if you are a DFS Army VIP, um, this is something that I can certainly share with you as far as read only so that you can kind of see what we're looking at each and every week as far as what took down the Millie Maker that week, total points, uh, price, pricing, fantasy points per dollar, ownership, and the stacks. So we can keep a track on this and see trends that are certainly popping up each and every week. Um, so this certainly helps to organize it. And one thing I've noticed is we're going to get into here, last year was a lot of skinny stacks, right? So... 2020, we saw a lot of heavier stacks, specifically the part of the the beginning of the year. It was Seattle uh, with Russell Wilson and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, and it you know it was Dak Prescott hitting um, CD Lamb and Amari Cooper. So there, there was a lot of stacking going on in 2020, specifically at the start of the year. And then in 2021, we saw scoring being down and just a lot of skinny stacks winning. Well, so far in 2022. Despite scoring being down overall, you know, lowest suspense since 2010, we've had a few games every week that really hit the over. And it's kind of been a lot of the same usual suspects who are getting into the, the winning Millie Maker lineups. So we've seen a lot of quarterback plus two. So week two, week four, week six. Um, and those all had bringbacks. And then week seven, week eight, you saw a quarterback plus two with no bringbacks. And week nine, quarterback plus two plus a bringback. Uh, we've also seen one, two, three, four weeks with secondary stacks. So five out of nine weeks with a quarterback plus two. Um, in those five out of nine weeks, we've also seen three weeks with a quarterback plus two and at least one bringback. And we've seen four weeks of at least one secondary stack. So this is something we're going to keep an eye on and keep that in mind going forward. It's kind of a question to ask yourself with scoring being as low as it's been, is this something that's going to continue to happen where we see, you know, so, so much heavy stacking or has what we've seen kind of been, you know, more of an outlier and it, maybe it's going to regress to the mean. I don't know what I would say for sure is keep, 
in mind the teams that have been involved over and over in those heavy stacks like Miami, for example. And if you're going to heavy stack, I would certainly there, – there are certain games and teams I would be looking to target for that. And as far as the other games, uh, you know, quarterback plus one is probably going to get it done most weeks if that's a game you're uh, trying to build around. So uh, with that right up, as I mentioned, Miami, they were back in it again this week. This time, it wasn't Tua, but it was Justin Fields, who has been absolutely electric over the past month of the season. Um, if you played him in DFS last week, if you had a lot of exposure to Justin Fields, you made money. You had to have Joe Mixon as well to, to make money. But uh, if you had those two, you were in great shape. Uh, if you have him in your redraft, your dynasty, um, you're, you're loving life right now as well. So Justin Fields, 45 points. Now, what was crazy about this is Fields threw for only like 127 yards and had two pass catchers with him, um, which is pretty crazy for throwing for so few yards and being able to bring two pass catchers with them, with him. But as we get into the salary, we'll we'll see kind of why that was the way it was because Fields is low priced as well as both of his pass catchers. Um, Ramondre Stevenson, 16 points. Joe Mixon, this was the top score on the slate. Um, just unreal because he, he had been so inefficient as a runner. But it was a great matchup, and he was just ready to go. Positive regression was headed his way. We just didn't expect it like this. We're going to have you know, two, two to three big games in basically one game. Crazy. Uh, so 58 points. Tyreek Hill, no surprise. He's been off to look back at it, but I'm – Sure of it. He's been the uh, constant in the winning Millie Maker lineups this year. The the most he's made the most appearances. Christian Kirk twenty one points. Darnell Mooney seventeen and a half. Cole Komet twenty two points. This was really uh, outside of Fields and Mixon. This was really the difference maker, as we know. Defense, uh, tight end and defenses are very high variance. And then Kenneth Walker. Not as good as a matchup. He was lower on. There was a lot of running back chalk. Didn't matter. He smashed again, 30 points. And then Patriots D, 26 points. Incredible. 268 points. So really, really high scoring again this week. So as far as stacking goes, you know, as I kind of just alluded to, Fields plus two with Mooney, Cole Komet, total stack. 85 points, uh, 24% ownership. So pretty good for three players, about an average of 8%. And then we had a secondary stack from Andre Stevenson and Patriots D 42 points, total stacking ownership, 50%. Uh, obviously a lot higher. Ramondre Stevenson was the chalk. He was 40% on and the total stacking points, 127 total stack ownership, 74%, which, you know, for five players, Pretty good, obviously. That said, this was we've seen a much higher increase in overall ownership over the past several weeks. So, you know, right in line with what we've seen. And if you've been paying attention, you might notice there has been several slates with over 250 points this year. So six out of nine to be exact, as we've now hit the halfway point of the NFL season. Um, and those slates have come with heavier stacking. And we saw on most weeks of the Millie Maker. In fact, week one, shout out to Rapid Fire XD, DFS Army VIP. Th this was the only time when we had a light up with over 250 points that didn't have a quarterback plus two pass catcher. So that was the skinny sack. That was the one exception of the season. Um, so weeks two, four, seven, eight, and nine all had a quarterback plus two pass catchers as we kind of just went over. Um, but what's crazy with this is the trend continues with the double stack so far this year, even with a running quarterback like Fields, who you really think, gosh, you can run him naked in a lot of lineups as, as we will get into and, and make a lot of money. Um, but for the most part, you would think at least you need Fields plus one, not this week. So double stack is always in the consideration at this point because 55% of the winning lineups have done it so far in 2022. So, Moving on to ownership, as we kind of talked about, it's crazy. 125 cent percent is way down compared to the past couple of weeks before that. We saw like 89, 189 percent, 175 percent. So 
what's crazy to me looking at this was 96% was the total team ownership of million maker winners in 2021 and 2020, it was higher. It was 108%. And through nine weeks of the NFL season, we're currently seeing an average of 120%. So we've had a lot of chalk smashing. So that's no surprise, of course. And it's pretty obvious to me, there's definitely a correlation between scores being higher and ownership being higher. So it seems like when scores are higher, people are on the chalk, the heavier stacks. And when it's more contrarian, obviously the scores are going to be down. So that is just a correlation that I've certainly noticed. Now the top leverage plays on the slate. So it's pretty crazy because it, the running back chalk has been so wild that normally you would think, you know, if you're looking for a leverage play, it's like 10% or less. But with running back chalk being 40%, 50% in some cases, or, you know, 20, 20 to 30%, you know, Kenneth Walker is a leverage play at 13%. He smashed 30 points. And then Joe Mixon, 12%. And he outscored the chalk by 30 points. So far and away, the top leverage play of the day. And near 10% ownership. Eckler was 24% owned. ETN was 39% owned. And Stevenson was 40% owned. So Eckler, uh, Mixon obviously was leverage off of all those players. And specifically, Stevenson was in this lineup. But lineups without Stevenson, uh, Mixon certainly leverage off of those lineups. And shout out to DFS Army because he did keep coming up in the domination station optimals. I didn't love him this week. I smashed a like on him and I still got like 15% exposure to him. So DFS army, the domination station does it again. Now, Cole Komet, great leverage play, top leverage play of the day, tight end back to back weeks. We've seen tight end be the difference maker. We've talked about it. it is a position of high variance. So if you can get a tight end, at low ownership and specifically if you can include it in a stack because uh last week we saw tyler conklin and um garrett wilson in a stack this week it was fields mooney and cole Komet. so well that's one thing we will when we get into the the top dfs pros mme strategy you will often see they will have a tight end in a stack yeah, specifically with variants, that's really the best way for it to predict that a tight end will have a big day and uh, be a difference maker. And then as far as pricing, so six consecutive weeks to start the season, we had no running back or pass catcher priced above 8K. We've now had three consecutive weeks of one running back or wide receiver price above 8K. And, you know, what it really takes, obviously, for a player of this high pricing to make an appearance in the winning lineup is when you have guys like Fields at 5,300 who smashes the salary uh, over 8X. And then, really, if you just look at the Fields, Mooney, Cole, Komet stack, this stack was so cheap, 5,300, 4,700, 3,000, averaging 4,300 a piece, which is over 6X their salary. So, when those type of players hit, you just know that a high ceiling or high floor, high ceiling player like Tyreek Hill is going to make his way into the winning Millie Maker lineup. And you're also able to pay up at defense. This is the highest price defense we've seen on the year, surpassing the $3,800 defense uh, of the Eagles that made its way into the Millie Maker in week four. Ceiling. Last thing. The ceiling. Now. Have one half of the year, 251 points. That's an average score of the Millie Maker winners, 251. So last year, 2021, is 233. The year before is 243. So right now, it's even higher, which is crazy with scoring being down. So shout again, shout out to Rapid Fire XD when he won the winning uh the Millie Maker week one. It was kind of a foreshadowing of what was the comp, right? He won it with 251 points. Here we are halfway through the season at 251 points. If you guys want to have the tools and multiple DFS Army subscribers have used to win the Millie, Bobby Wow, Bobby Millions, Rapid Fire XD. Right now, to gain access to this, you can use, use code Fantasy Fling at 10% off. 
uh, VIP subscription, or come to this article. I tweeted out. It's on my Twitter at Fantasy Fling, and you can also try a VIP membership for free for one month. So all you have to do is click here, and I'll click here and just kind of show you. Lots of different options. You can sign up for Monkey Knife Fight. Use code DFS Army, prize picks, owner's box, underdog fantasy. Owner's box is uh, DFS Army meets Superflex. Really cool. Underdog, Thrive. They do uh, basically player props in a giant pool against a bunch of other uh, field of other uh, players you're trying to beat out. So there's lots of different options for you. Over-unders, you could do best ball, whatever it is you like. So you have a lot of different options there. Um, use code DFS Army for a free membership. So let's move along to the MME portion of the show. So what we are going to do is we're going to look at the top um, MME pros, essentially, and their strategy that they use on this past slate. So we're going to start with the whistle goes woo. Top five. He is a top five DFS pro over at Roto Grinders, uh, specifically with NFL. So I, I believe he's currently about third or between third and fifth. But a couple things, uh, his top lineup. So he had a Tua, Jaseki, and Mooney stack. So he, he stacked the other side of that game, obviously, not the field side. Tua, um, Jaseki, then brought it back with Mooney. But what's crazy about this and I, I've built lineups like this before, and I always wondered, am I stacking too much? You know, are there not some good one-offs? But certainly in this case, there there were. Um, ETN was the chalk. And uh, Zay Jones himself, he was popping in the DFS Army uh, uh, domination station. And then Devontae Adams coming in pretty low owned for his skill set. I mean, I mean, 6.9%. He's 8,100. He smashed. Uh, fantastic play. And then obviously Mixon and Higgins, who we'll see a lot of Mixon and Higgins and a lot of the, the top MME pros. Um, obviously Mixon, just the game he had, this, this stack was incredible just getting there on his own. I mean, Higgins could have had a zero and this stack would have still been really efficient. So over 193 points, this was his top lineup. But, uh, you know, losing day overall, minus 1,500 ROI, um, which is pretty crazy. You know, you have Joe Mixon and you you have a few pieces th that really took down the million. and it just wasn't quite enough. And um, when we look at his exposures, we'll kind of see, see why here, because there just really wasn't enough fields. So yeah, he only had 6% fields. It was one of those things where to, to win a large field GPP, you pretty much had to have fields and Mixon. Um, and, and you most likely had to, you had to have Devontae Adams too because he was the top scoring wide receiver on the slate and no one else was close behind him. So you could see in his exposures, kind of just all over the place, not really in on any one quarterback. Um, and this was... Kind of the theme of the day, very flat, getting a little bit of exposure to everyone, but but no huge exposure to anyone. Like if we're looking at fields being, you know, 20 to 30 percent owned. We're talking about a different day. This is obviously negative leverage because the field was 14 percent on fields. He was only 66 percent and fields absolutely smashed. So a running back, though. You know, he was high on Joe Mixit, but really because. Fields had such a, a ceiling type day and he was chalk. It just wasn't enough. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, he was pretty much all in on him, 72%. Joe Mixon, 32%. Deion Jackson, I thought this was a pretty sharp play given, you know, the fact that he was low priced and they were looking to run the ball. There was no Jonathan Taylor um, for starting running back. You know, I thought it was pretty good. He ended up being chalk when it was all said and done. Um, but yeah, Josh Jacobs. A little bit over the field on that. And then Kenneth Walker, just over the field. Aaron Jones, just under the field. But Aaron Jones obviously had a horrible day. If You know, if you play Aaron Jones, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then ETN and Eckler, under the field on both of these guys. But, you know, a lot of exposure to the chalk running backs playing 
a wide range of quarterbacks will certainly allow that to be possible. And then Amra, Amon Ra, he was in a, a great spot. He just didn't get there. It That was just an ugly, ugly game. Tyler Lockett, pretty good day. DJ Moore. If Baker Mayfield is playing, DJ Moore is pretty much worthless. Um, that's just, Baker just doesn't target him enough. So PJ Walker got benched and Baker Mayfield came in. I mean, is there more of a knee jerk reaction organization than the Carolina Panthers? Probably not. I'm not going to get off the rails too much here, but I mean, it just changes week to week, half to half. It's crazy. So Stefan Diggs, Higgins, Tyreek Hill, obviously he was the top play on the slate. DFS army was all over that. Metcalf, Myers, Wilson, so on and so forth. All right. So we're going to get into a few of the other top pros. Now, not all the guys lost money. So awesome. Now, I kind of I tweeted this out the other day, and, and this was when I first started looking at you know some of the top DFS pros lineups. When you are an MME player, an MME pro, such as Osmo and some of these other guys, over the long run, it is a positive EV decision to overstack games. So I've noticed Osmo, this is his strategy a lot. So he will overstack games and he will play some really good plays like Travis Etienne, Ramondre Stevenson, Josh Palmer, you know, the chalk. And he's going to overstack this game, getting different. And nine times out of 10, it's going to fail. And, you know, it's it's probably much higher than that. It's like 99 times out of 100, it's it's not going to get there, right? It, like, it's, it's it may cash, it may min cash, but it's gonna, not going to get anywhere near close to winning the i mean this was like you know almost 90 points away from from a winning lineup and this was his best lineup however they have the bankroll to do something like this because he knows he's eventually going to win the million maker and it's going to make up for his negative eighteen hundred dollars his negative two thousand dollars his negative three thousand dollars over the course of the season and this is why he's one of the best in the world he he understands this week to week he's going to have a lot of downswing he's going to have a lot of negative weeks but when that one lineup hits it's going to take care of the entire season obviously if you're not an mme player uh I, I and with a huge bankroll i would not suggest playing like this because this is a big way to lose most of your bankroll very quickly but you notice burrow higgins hayden hurst joe mixon so even though two joe mixon scored 58 points hurst burrow and Higgins were kind of no, nowhere near there, right? So they would have had to have scored, you know, 70, you know, 50, 60 points, like just crazy amount of touchdowns and it to be very spread out. And it just it just didn't get there. And you will see this. This isn't just one lineup. He had a lot of lineups like this. Burrow, Mixon, Higgins, Hurst. And this kind of the same thing. Attacked another game. Gino, DK, Lockett. Walker, Seattle. So Gino plus one, two, three, and the defense. Mixon, Burrow, Boyd, Hurst. Burrow, Higgins, Hurst, Mixon. Now, Couple things that I noticed with him, obviously lots of lots of uh, Burrow plus three, obviously the Geno plus four that we talked about. But he also he didn't have hardly any Adams, and he pretty much faded Hill. So he was under the field on Hill nine percent. Josh Palmer, he was under the field on Josh Palmer. So he more so ate a lot of the running back chalk 
and he faded the wide receivers. Basically, his thought process, it's pretty easy to, to figure it out from his strategy, was I'm going to fade some of these chalky wide receivers, which I think they're probably not going to get there with their ceiling, uh, specifically a guy like Palmer, or maybe he's hoping Tyreek Hill, f- you know, fails at his salary and whatnot. Um, and he was obviously in Burrow stacks. He was huge on Burrow. So Burrow and Boyd, he was very heavy on these in relation to the field. Um, but yeah, faded some of the chalkier wide receivers just because he was very heavy on the running back. So you got to get different somewhere. Ramondre Stevens is 76%. Joe Mixon, 44%. Uh, Travis Etienne, 31%. So that's awesome strategy for the day. It didn't work, but I guarantee you soon enough, not before long, we're going to be like awesome with this crazy plus three, plus four stack. Basically, the kind of that we saw with the Lions and Seattle, which was just unreal, plus quarterback, plus two, bringing it back plus three on the other side. It eventually will hit. All right. So Utico, Utico. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. That's who we're looking at up next. So basically broke even, right? Minus, minus $5. So we're going to go through a couple of his top lineups. And, I, you know, I, that's part of the podcast this podcast that I want to look at a little bit more is kind of the top lineups because exposures are great, but we want to see like how they got to exposures, how they constructed those lineups. So he had Trevor Lawrence plus two ETN and Christian Kirk with a Devontae Adams bring back. And then Ramondre Stevenson is a one-off Josh Palmer uh, actually, Josh Palmer and Kyle Pitts in a stack as well. And then uh, Joe Mixon is a one-off. So really good lineup. Obviously, pretty high on 167%, which is kind of surprising it wasn't duplicated at all. Um, you know, but a very efficient lineup, of course. And 216 points. So he had a lineup. I think it scored like 190. Some Mixon and Higgins. Little stacks. Geno plus three. Carr, Adams, and Moreau. Brought back with Etienne and Christian Kirk. So pretty big game stack there. All right, so this is the lineup. And this is kind of crazy. This is like a top three DFS pro in the world. So close to the winning Millie Maker lineup, right? In a lot of ways. Like Justin Fields plus Dar- Darnell Mooney plus Cole Komet plus Tyreek Hill. So literally hitting the right stack, the stack that won the Millie Maker. But the biggest difference is it was decisions and chalk running backs. So he played two chalk running backs and got different in Kenneth Walker. So what two, three, four, five, six players, six of nine players that were exact same in the winning million maker lineup. The biggest difference he played Aaron Jones as opposed to Joe Mixon. So if he'd swapped out Aaron Jones for Joe Mixon, there would have been extra salary there. And Christian Kirk versus Tyler Lockett. So this was obviously, uh, you know, just choosing a couple different running back, a, a running back, and then playing Tyler Lockett over Christian Kirk, and then just being able to afford the Washington defense at 2,400. So you can see how you can have so many things right, you can make great money, made 80 bucks here, but still – those final three roster spots were the difference between winning 80 bucks and a milli. And obviously you could say a lot of people can say that, but when you look at a top DFS pro, one of the top DFS pros in the world, he's won so many GPPs. Um, and they're obviously that much closer than 
someone who just got lucky variance this one time was like, ah, oh, I was so close. Um, God knows what he's doing. So look at his exposures real quick. So kind of as I, I mentioned when I opened the show, you will see a lot of just kind of flat exposures to quarterbacks just across the board, getting a lot of different exposure, 10%, 10%, 50%, 13%. Um, and really because eating a lot of running back chalk. So how am I going to get different, right? So Kirk Cousins, 10% uh, exposure. He was only 3% own. So just trying to have the right combination that is different enough to take down the melee. And mix in, you know, it's pretty crazy. I, I, I had a little bit of exposure to mix in, but if I had 40 plus percent exposure to mix in like Osimo and, and Utico, and I had a losing day, I would just, I mean, what a brutal slate, right? Like you had to do so much right to win the slate. So uh, Josh Jacobs, 27%, Deion Jackson, 20%, Ramondre Stevenson, 46 Just over the field on Kenneth Walker. And then ETN and Jones and Eckler. And, you know, really, for Eckler's salary, he didn't quite do enough. So you have 15% exposure to him. You have 21% exposure to Aaron Jones, who just totally bombed at 7,400 um, in a smash spot. This is how you have a losing day, despite having Joe Mixon 46% and still not cashing. Kirk, Higgins, DK, Tyler. So decent day for some of these guys, but not nearly enough to win a tournament, you know, and that's kind of what it is. Adams, smash, but 14% just wasn't enough. Brock Wright, I mean, I felt like kind of an idiot playing Brock Wright. I was like, this can go bad. We don't even know if he's going to get the targets, but he's $2,500, so punt. Well, I feel less bad about it now. 14% uh, from one of the top pros in the world. Boston Moreau, obviously a good play with Waller being out. Hayden Hurst in Burrow Stacks was a great play. And then Pitts and Ingram. Ingram projected really well, and DFS Army was all over it in both the coaches' notes and the domination station. So we're going to finish this up by some MME review of winning strategies this past weekend. So McLovin, 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 I don't know. I like calling him McLovin. He had a, a positive week. So anytime you MME a uh, contest, you don't win it, but you have positive ROI, you will take that for sure. So, and the reason that McLovin had positive ROI is because he had a lot of fields plus Mooney bringing it back with Tyreek Hill stacks, as you will see here. This is Line up one seven hundred fifty dollars in the milli, which is fantastic, and you know placed in the top one hundred two hundred and thirty two points fields. Actually, this is pretty crazy. This lineup didn't have Mooney in it, but we will see that he had several of Mooney. Um, this one had Cole Komet and Tyreek Hill, of course, and then uh, Christian Kirk, Josh Jacobs, and then Mixon Stevenson. Garrett Wilson and Arizona D is a one-off and, and very low owned considering the slate. So extremely good. Here we go. Justin Fields, Mooney, Tyreek Hill. So lots of those two. And really those were the guys that uh, were responsible for cashing for him. And then obviously Mixon in every one of those lineups. So Fields, Mixon, Mooney, and Tyreek Hill. Just, I mean, how can you not cash with that? 
So very good. Just get different all sorts of ways with this lineup. Really trying to think the contest. Let me go to exposures. It's pretty crazy because even, you know, with the, the top lineups scoring the, the bulk of the money, most of the pros weren't like crazy high on fields. Like it's not like they had, you know, 50 plus percent exposure, but it was enough to, to make the day for, for McLovin here. 10%. Uh, Rogers, the same 10%. He projected really well, just total bombed. Uh, Mariota, 15%. Gino, 10%. So really the same with Gino and Rogers that you had with Fields. And, you know, more or less the same with Josh Allen and Trevor Lawrence. But the stacks were right with Fields. It was Mooney. It was a uh, bring back with Tua. And then obviously, or bring back with Hill. And then obviously you had uh, Joe Mixon in those lineups. So the theme of the day was a lot of exposure to Joe Mixon. But you had to have Fields as well. You had to have him in those lineups. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, a lot there. As we've seen, Jacobs, Eckler, ETN. So on and so forth. Zay Jones, Amon Ra. You know, guys are projected very well from a fantasy points per dollar basis. And also with Amon Ra, you know, it's just a great matchup. TJ Hawkinson just got traded. He expected more passes to the funnel to Amon Ra. Just didn't get there, but it was still a great play. Got a lot of targets, just didn't get the touchdowns. <clears throat> Jacoby Myers, decent day. Khalif Raymond. So, you know, you've seen some value guys in here. Obviously, Raymond, Wilson. A little bit of DeAndre Carter. So just get different in a lot of ways with the running back chalk. But uh, one thing I did notice a lot of the, the pros, their strategy was, okay, if I'm going to play Ramondre Stevenson at, you know, 40% exposure, I'm not going to play Josh Palmer at 32% exposure. I can't have two or 32% ownership. So I can't have two players, 72% ownership. So this is like you you kind of needed to take a stand, right? And obviously they they're top DFS pros, they know what the ownership projections, probably what they're projected as and what they might end up being. I was listening to like Blender each HD this week, and he was saying every site, all the all the top sites, they all kind of say the same plays. This guy's coming in projected as low owned. This is a good play. This guy's projected as low owned. This is a good play. So when all the same sites, uh, sharp, sharp DFS minds, I might add, are saying the same guys are projected as lower owned than you would think they should be, then a lot of people are going to be on these plays. So if they're projected at like 8%, for example, you could probably bump their projection to 15%, 12%. Um, and, and that really helps you construct your lineups so that you're not – ended up ending up with a chalkier lineup than you thought. Like if you want your lineup to be more contrary and you're going to have to look for other ways to get different. So certainly when you have crazy Josh Palmer chalk, you could just, you got to take a stand. I got to, I got to fade that. And then I'll play Stevenson or vice versa. So last guy from the MME status, MME pro status, we will look at need lunch money. Um, I was scrolling down the leaderboards. I saw him put several lineups into the top 100. He had the best ROI day from, from like the top five, top 10 DFS pros that I saw. So I wanted to review his lineup and see what he did differently, uh, or his MME strategy, his lineups rather, because he had a lot of them. So top one fields, Mooney brought back with Tyreek Hill. Mixon, ETN, and then obviously he had an Amon Ra and Robert Tanyan stack. Kenneth Walker, New York Jets D 2000. I, I played the New York Jets D too in cash, and I was I was like holding my breath, but they have a good defense. So it was just a matchup with, that determined the pricing. If they were going against anyone else, they would have been priced closer to 3000 than they would 2000 Promise you that. 
So Fields, Mooney, Hill. Again, the theme of the day, a lot of Fields plus one, bring it back with Tyree Kill. Mixon, ETN. Boston Moreau, Kenneth Walker, Seattle. So, so a lot of really good lineups. I mean, just with the first two, we're looking at $2,500 plus. That's how you do it. Um, just crushed it. I mean, so many lineups within the top 100, top 200. A um, lot of fields here. And, you know, when we look at exposures, it's not always necessarily like, oh, this person had like 80% fields or whatever, maybe 60%. It's oftentimes they just had the right stacks within those lineups. Just precision. Yeah, actually under the field on Justin Fields and still had a $3,500 ROI day. Um, and some very good lineups. Crazy, the highest Exposure at quarterback, Marcus Mariota. And really, a lot of exposure to all the different quarterbacks. Ellinger, Jones, Allen, Heineke, Carr, Fields, Cousins, Murray, Gino, Rogers, Trevor, uh, Joe Burrow. Just looking for ways to get different, obviously. Look at this. 42% to Mixon, Stevenson, 62%, Deion Jackson, 32% Jacobs, Eckler, Kenneth Walker. So the right plays at running back. Over the field there, under the field on Jones and ETN. Amon Ra, DJ Moore, which DJ Moore probably would have been a better play too had PJ Walker stayed in the game, just, you know, not took a dump in his helmet, played better. Um, stayed in the game because he certainly PJ Walker targets target targets DJ Moore a lot more. Drake London, a little above the field on Diggs, and it was a bad matchup, but you know, low owned, so sharp. under the field on Palmer again. So it's one thing to think about guys, when you're building your lineups for a large field GPP, like the Millie maker, if you are going to be in on the running back chalk and there's wide receiver chalk, you probably need to make a rule that you don't have like 40% Ramondre Stevenson and 30% Josh Palmer in the same lineup. All right. Last thing I want to look at. Now, I haven't seen his name at the top of the leaderboards as far as top DFS pros in the world, but I continue to see DFS Army, VIP, Cuckoo, and a lot of the top 100 leaderboards in the Millie Maker every week. Not, it may not be every week, but I've noticed his name several times. So one thing I wanted to take a look at because he plays yeah, 144th, so pretty close, and he had positive ROI on the day, the 150 lineups, plus $1,200, and he had a lot of fields lineups just ran naked. So... Justin Fields, and, and you could do that more so with a running quarterback, right? So I'd probably make a rule, you know, plus one, but it's definitely like it's something you can do with a running quarterback because let's be honest, Fields could have had tournament winning upside without bringing any wide receivers with him. I mean, he rushed for 40. I mean, he rushed for over 100 yards and two touchdowns. So he, well, he threw three touchdowns, but he rushed for over hundred yards and had a touchdown. So 5,300 salary, he had tournament winning upside without really bringing any wide receivers with him. So running naked him, it obviously works as well as this lineup. You know, you put $20 in, you win $600, you place hundred and the top 150 of the million maker. You'll certainly take that. And so it's something to think about running quarterbacks. I normally wouldn't stack them with two. I do think this week was an outlier, uh, uh, but I would normally would stack them with at least one. But I have 
specifically in smaller tournaments, ran them by themselves um, without another pass catcher. So Fields, Mixon, Stevenson, Jefferson, Palmer, Marshall, Hurst, Eckler, and Jets D. And you'll see a lot of winning lineups without Fields, just playing other stacks from other games, Devontae Adams and uh, Ingram. Some really good one-offs. Same thing here. Palmer, Eckler. And we look at his exposures. Kyla Murray, Justin Fields, Justin Herbert. So was was in on Fields. So very sharp. Didn't just luck into this. Was very heavy on Fields. Herbert. Rodgers, obviously, was a great play. Didn't get there. Ramondre, 61%. Jacobs, Mixon. So a lot of the same exposures you're seeing with a lot of the top DFS pros. Austin Eckler, Kenneth Walker, over the field there. Deion Jackson, very sharp. Positive ROI day for Cuckoo, DFS Army VIP. If you guys want access to... The Coach's Notes, the Domination Station, the Statsational Power Rankings, which, by the way, helps predict a lot of these matchups, these good premier matchups. Now's the time. I know a lot of subscribers to DFS Army, uh, or a lot of people, rather, watch the show but aren't a subscriber. Well, use code FANTASYFING for 10% off the VIP subscription, or go to my article, get free access for a month. 